Philippians 5, I got filled with the Spirit, brother. I couldn't stop. Okay. Second Corinthians five. Nick, are you still trying prayers? Uh, What's up, man? He was just a little kid. He came uh, after service. He could have been more about six years old. He goes, "You prayed for five minutes? Just second service? Or whatever it was? It was hilarious." <laughs> Okay, well, pressure's on now. Okay. All right, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We've been looking at uh, this chapter that Paul wrote, and he made a lot of comparisons the, the eternal versus the temporal, the, uh, the uh, raised up body, the resurrection body, versus our bodies in this world that groan and are decaying and so forth. Um, <coughs> we'll start this morning, I believe, in verse 13. And uh, Paul has says, said here in verse 13, if we are beside ourselves, and it's, what he's saying there is if, you know, if we seem crazy, if we seem like nuts, we're going to pick up that topic in a second. Uh, we do that for the Lord. That's for the Lord. And, and there's a sense in with it that's very instructive that in one sense, he doesn't care what the world thinks of him. He wants to put Christ first. If the world can't handle that, that's their problem. Uh, but he doesn't care. And he says, uh, so if if we are beside ourselves, it's for God. If we are of sound mind, it's for you. So he does want his ministry to them to be reasonable, sensible, uh, effective. Um, and he has had this ongoing thing, as we've seen over and over in this book, of the some people in the city of Corinth are really uh, against Paul. And they're trying to... Uh, bring him down. They're saying discouraging things to people about Paul and, and trying to usurp his authority and undermine him. But he, he wants to make sure, and we'll see this much more in this book, that they know that he's legitimate, that he's preaching the true gospel. Uh, so in any case, whatever the world may think, whatever the world may think of Paul or of you, if you're serving Christ, um, Remember just three verses before that, in verse, in verse 10, Paul had said, we looked at, we spent a long time looking at that verse, it's Jesus we have to answer to. It's Jesus that will evaluate our lives, not humans. Jesus is the one, and, and I made a big case about that, you know, not being, we're not going to stand before him and have to answer for all our sin, that's not the idea at all. But nonetheless, Jesus will evaluate our lives. And how effective we serve him. So, in fact, you, you might remember Matthew 10, 28. Jesus said, do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul. Rather, fear him, respect, reverence, obey God, who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. And the word there that Jesus, there's two words that typically in New Testament can be translated as hell. One is Hades which is where the lost are right now. The other one is the Greek word Gehenna, which is the lake of fire we see in, in Revelation 20. And if there's a worse place in the universe than Hades, it's Gehenna. And that's the word Jesus uses there. Destroy both body and soul in Gehenna. Described, described in Revelation 20. We know Christ the Savior. We're not going to be there. But nonetheless, Jesus is the one that we have to answer to. So, um, what is it, and, and we started on this list at, right at the end of class last week, week, and we ran out of time. Why is it that the world might think we're crazy? I got about, about a dozen things here. Sometimes Christianity has, I think, rightly been referred to as an upside down kingdom because everything we do and everything that motivates us is the opposite of the world. It really is. And it's remarkable when you line all these up, you see how different we are or we're supposed to be than the way the world operates. Now, I'm going to give you a list of about 12 things. I admit none of us are perfect. We don't do these perfectly. I get it. Not far from it for me. But nonetheless, these are some of the things the scripture tells us how we ought to live. Um, okay, first of all, we choose to serve. We don't lord it. We're not supposed to lord it over others. I think I, I mentioned last week, probably all of us, we're all, of it, we're all adults. We probably had a boss somewhere along the way 
who just was kind of like, I'm in charge here. I'm going to lord it over you. You're my employee. And, and they were maybe kind of jerks to us when they didn't need you. Uh, so we've all been around people. I know you, Bush. <laughs> You've been there, buddy. Uh, we've all been around people who want to lord it over us and <coughs> give, them, give them an inch and they'll take a mile kind of a thing. But we choose to serve. Uh, and who was the greatest servant of all? Jesus. Yeah. He didn't come to be served, but to serve. Another one, uh, and again, I mentioned this last week, we give away our money instead of hoarding it. You know, that's a, a matter between you and God. But God has called us to give our money to the work of the Lord. One way you can do that is give it to your church. And we are responsible to do that. God has called us to it. You know, I mentioned this wonderful uh, addition we put on. What was it? 10 years? 15. 15? 15? 2015. Oh, okay. 2000, some years. And uh, all the giving, well over a million dollars this church did. Praise God, it was amazing. That was all, I think, pretty much all over and above regular tithes and offerings that people gave. So that was an amazing work of the Lord. You know, there's occasions in the New Testament when the Lord just comes, came upon the Jews and they just gave and gave and gave. One occasion Moses had to say, stop giving, stop giving. That's enough. But we give our money away instead of hoarding it. Uh, here's another one. And this is a difficult one. We forgive instead of seeking vengeance. Well, that is not the way of the world, is it? But we have been called because we're forgiven to forgive those who may hurt us in some way. Um, that's the opposite of the world, and it's not easy to do, and sometimes we'll spend time talking about what does forgiveness look like. But nonetheless, um, we forgive instead of seeking revenge. Another one, we pray for those who hurt us, and we love those who hate us. Now, that's not a worldly thing at all, is it? No, it's not. But in the Christian world, we are to pray for those who hurt us, love those who hate us, that was spoken by Jesus himself. Um, let's see. We, we grow through our trials. The scripture talks about rejoicing in, in our trials um, instead of being bitter and complaining and whining like I do most of the time. <laughs> I do. I'm sorry to say it. Uh, that's kind of the way I am, but that's not the right response. The Bible, <laughs> the Bible is very clear. We are to rejoice in our trials, look at them as opportunities to grow and to and to rejoice in. So that's another thing that we do that's the opposite of the world. Um, we help others even when it may cost us something. You, you know the, you all know the story, I'm sure, of the Good Samaritan who helped out what, who somebody who was, in essence, kind of his enemy. And it cost him something. It wasn't some free and easy thing for him, but he helped out another human being and it cost him something, and it wasn't convenient. When I say it cost him, he literally had to pay some, or he chose to pay some to take care of this person. So we help those out who are in difficulty, even if it costs us something. Jesus has called to that. Here's one. I'm going to get you on this one. We hold our tongues. We don't gossip. That is not the way of the world. I remember working in an office. No offense, ladies, but there were three or four ladies in the office, and whew, it got rough in there sometimes, the gossip. I know guys can do it too. But we hold our tongues. We don't gossip. We don't lie. Why do we do that? Because we love other people. I mean, that's the idea behind it. We don't want to tear other people down. But that's not the way of the world at all. Um, here's another one. We just talked about um, our missionary lady we prayed for this morning. We may go to dangerous places in obedience to God. And boy, you read the life of Paul and Peter and the early apostles. That's what they did all the time. Went to dangerous places for the sake of the gospel in obedience to God. So I don't know if God's ever called you to that kind of situation, but he can. It's his right to do that. And, and so that's the opposite of the world. Of course, the world typically doesn't want to go to dangerous places unless you're a great uh, soldier like Nick Drew was and you're willing to go for the sake of your country. But typically, people don't do that. But in obedience to God, people have been doing that for 2,000 years. <coughs> so let's see what else. A couple more. Uh, here's, a, here's one I want to challenge you with. We remain sexually pure when the world runs after lust. That's a big one. 
we are to be pure, even though that's not the way of the world. Also, uh, well, we've just gone through this wonderful prayer time we had. Now we know we are to pray fifth. Pray first, that's right. Not fifth, pray first. Not as a last resort. Now, I don't know about you, I've talked to people, I don't even know if they were Christians, but they would say things like, you know, I don't know what else to do, I, I, maybe I should pray. Well, don't wait until the last, so the, the last emergency moment. Pray first. Again, a great, great lesson. I hope we all learned there. Uh, another one, deny yourself while the world wants to indulge self. Who, who said to deny yourself? <coughs> deny yourself? Who said that? Jesus. Jesus said, deny yourself because yourself is evil. That's not the way of the world. Um, here's one more. One more. We store up treasure in heaven rather than investing everything in this world. Store up treasure in heaven. And kind of all these things I've mentioned are different ways to store up treasure in heaven. But, so, is anybody perfect in all those things? No, unfortunately we're not. Not yet, anyway. Someday. Uh, but the point is, we live in this upside-down kingdom, this Christian kingdom. It's the opposite of the world. Now, one of the most amazing things about this is, even though people may think you're crazy because you're committed to Christ, they may, because you try to live this way. Here's the most amazing thing of all to me. The more effectively we live that way, the more the world is drawn to Jesus. Do you realize that? The more faithfully we live for Christ in these, uh, in these ways that sacrifice and show we're not of this world, the more effective witnesses we are for Jesus. And the more people will probably say, hey, what makes you different? Why do you live that way? So even though the world in the flesh doesn't want that, the reality is when they see it in us, it attracts them. And it can open doors. And I've seen that happen in my own life. So uh, we look at all these things. And, and for example, Peter said in 2 Peter 3, I believe it was, he listed a bunch of the struggles and so forth and the difficulties of, the, of, of life in the world. And then he asked the question, remember, how then shall we live? How should we live? Knowing everything that we've just said this morning. How should we live? And I think you know. You get it, right? So even if the world thinks you're crazy, that's okay. It's okay. Um, something that comes to mind is uh, when you talk about acting crazy or in an unexpected way, is the way David danced before the Lord. And uh, his wife chided him for yep. being undignified. Yep. Yeah, he was not acting in what she thought was a kingly way, so she was embarrassed and ashamed of him. He didn't care. He didn't care. Dance before the Lord. Okay. All right, let's look at uh, verse 14 now, <coughs> 2 Corinthians 5. For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died, therefore all died. Now this is a little bit of a difficult verse in some ways. Um, the love of Christ controls us, controls us, suneco, that, uh, that word means obviously control, or holds us together. The love of Christ holds us together or holds us fast. Well, let me ask you, does it? Does the love of Christ hold you together? I hope it does. That's what Paul says it should be doing. It should hold fast. It should hold you fast in your relationship with it. Does Christ love? Ready? Does it compel you? Does it direct you? Does it guide you? Does it hold you together? And I, I, I know you, most of you people, so I, I, I think I would say yes. It seems like to me it does do that. And that's what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to compel you, direct you, and guide you. And like I mentioned, Peter's question, how then shall we live? Well, we shall live for the Lord. And his love will guide us. His love will control us. So because of Christ's love, he says, one died for all, therefore all died. Now, we know this idea of one died for all. For example, we see that in Romans 5, as Paul talks about, you know, Adam died, Adam sinned, and, and that caused all humanity to be lost. And then Jesus came 
And he died for everyone on the face of the earth, every single person Jesus died for. Um, so uh, Jesus died for all. His death was not limited to just the people that God would save, the so-called elect. He did not just die for the elect. He died for all people. It was not a limited atonement that some people hold to that idea. Um, but I want to show you, I want to show you several verses that ensure us that Jesus died for all humanity. Now, this is to me, this is important because this tells me anybody I'm sharing the gospel with, Jesus died for that person. It's not based on a, a random uh, predestined thing that God did and just died for the elect. This is great news in my opinion. Because I can share the gospel with people knowing Jesus died for this person. He wants them saved. So here's some verses related to that. Um, 1 John 2, 2. He himself, Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins. And not for those only, but for those of the whole world. Again, that's great news. If you talk to people about Christ, you can be 100% sure Jesus died for this person. And wants them to be saved. First Timothy 2, 4 to 6. He desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all the testimony given at the proper time. Here's another verse. May, maybe anybody ever heard of John 3:16? Yeah, we know that one, don't we? Yeah, ooh, wait, wait a minute. I used to, I remember seeing that at the football game. Somebody was always in the end zone holding John 3, 16 up. Good for, for God so loved the world, and that Greek word is cosmos. And guess what it means? It means the whole world, everybody. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him, notice that whoever believes in him, shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. And one more, Titus 2.11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Great verse. Now let me ask you this. Does everybody get saved? No. No. Because God has given us a free will to make choices. So we can choose against that dying for the world. And he died for the world, I guess we could say, in potential. Everybody can come to Christ, but many, many don't, as you know. Uh, unfortunately, many don't. So, do all get saved? No, yet in potential, Jesus died for all. Here's what the pulpit commentary says about this verse. Christ died on behalf of all men, and consequently in that death, all potentially died with him. Now, this is the, this is the not frustrating, but the difficult thing in this verse that we're looking at. Um, he says that one died for all. We get that. Then he says, therefore all died. Now that's a little difficult, and there's different views on that. But the pulpit can, uh, commentary, and I think this is the best answer, says that potentially, just like potentially all could be saved, potentially all died with him. And first we talk about dying with Christ. We're talking about dying to sin, dying to the flesh, and those kinds of things. So you, you get that. And I think it's the same idea there. Dying potentially all die. Um, so uh, let me read to you Colossians 3, 3 and 4, just to kind of wrap this verse up. For you have died. There's what Paul says to us. You have died. In what sense did you die? Well, you died to sin. You died, in a sense, to, to a spiritual death. You died to Satan. You died to hell. All of those, that term could be applied to all those things. You died to those things. Now, here's the problem um, for us as Christians, and Romans 6 talks about that. If we choose to, we can continue presenting ourselves to sin. Now, the beauty of getting saved and becoming a Christian is you don't have to do that anymore. Before you were saved, you couldn't help it. You were presenting yourself to sin every day because that's what our nature was. Now you don't have to anymore. And that is the beauty of the gospel. You don't have to. Now you still can, and if you do, 
God will eventually bring uh, some discipline in your life. And by the way, he's done that to me. I'm a little dumb spiritually, Karen, don't say anything. I, I get it. And God's had to do that to me. But anyway, Colossians 3, 3 and 4. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Do you realize your life, your spiritual life is hidden with Christ in God? Isn't that amazing? Can I get an amen? Amen. amen? amen, thank you. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, and that's talking about the second coming, then you also, you will be revealed with him in glory. And my, every morning I, got out, I get out of bed now, I go, please, Lord, please, take care of this body. Come quickly. Give me my new body. Because there's groaning and aches and all, you know, you know. So, come quickly, Lord. All right, let's move on to verse 15. Verse 15, and he died for all, so that they who might live no longer live for themselves. So that they who might live no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. So Paul kind of expands now on his statement from verse 14, when he says the love of Christ controls us or compels us. Um, he died for all, so that they so that they who live. Paul acknowledges Christ's atonement for all. Again, the atonement is for all. It's intended for everyone. He died for everyone. There's no limitation for it. But he now, Paul immediately adds sort of a parameter on this and says, so that they who live, now there's a parameter here. Although Jesus died for all, they who love, live shows that some, or we might even say many, Remain spiritually dead. Sadly. He died for all, but many, and maybe even most, I don't know, remain spiritually dead. And of course, I just mean by that unsaved. They don't get saved. They don't get redeemed. But those who live, that is those who get saved, hopefully all of us in here, and we are resurrected, we are regenerated. Us, the point is, this is a real challenge to our lives. We no longer live for ourselves. Also, they no longer live for themselves. Oh, this is a, and I, I can hardly state it in normal words. This is a radical, fundamental, existential change in our being. And it's as radical as you can get. Uh, we live for Christ. And, and we, we mentioned all those things, a dozen or so, that are completely opposite in our lives from the world. The fact that we are now to live for Christ, again, is absolutely fundamental change. As radical as it can get um, in, in that we, our life has been turned upside down. The lost live for self. The saved live for him who died and rose again on their behalf, as Paul says that in that verse. So, again, the question, are we living this way? Are we living for him? And, and we probably are in degrees, and yes, the very next thing I wrote in my notes is, yes, this is a process. It is a lifelong process of discovering what it means to live for Christ. And the longer you've known Jesus, the more your life should represent that. Uh, you know, people who have been Christians for many, many years, like me, Gary, ought to really reflect the uh, Lordship of Christ. So, uh, there are many practical applications of this lifelong process. Many. And I want to read you kind of a lengthy passage from Colossians 3. If you want to turn there, I'm going to read about 17 verses. And I'm reading this because in this verse, Paul shows the practical applications of living for Christ. Now, as I read through this, I want you to notice that some of the things he says, you shouldn't be doing these anymore. Some of them he says, you should be doing these things now. So it's both things that we should be putting off and things we should be putting on. But this is the process of, if you will, we're, we're Wesleyans. I don't know what you are, John, but we're Wesleyans here. So we're big on holiness, right? And this is what holy lives begin to look like. Colossians 3. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, and if you know Christ, you have been. That's not an if. That's a for sure. If you've been raised up with Christ, keep on, and that's the Greek, by the way, keep 
on seeking. You can see the perpetuity of it right there. Keep on seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind. Here's something we need to do. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. And he answers the question, well, why should I do that? He says, well, you have died. Spirit, uh, uh, in the flesh, you have died in, in that you're no longer controlled by the flesh. You died when Jesus raised you up and resurrected you. You have died with you have died in your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, that's the second coming, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, here's one of Paul's famous therefores, which is the therefore, therefore, right? Um, consider the members or reckon the members of your earthly body as dead. And here's a bunch of things he says now we shouldn't be doing anymore. Immorality, impurity. Passion, passion there is not a, we use the word passion today, and we can use it in a positive way. In this text, it's not a positive thing. Passion was a bad thing. Evil desire, greed, which amounts to idolatry. In fact, it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you were once walking. Notice that. He says, you used to walk in those things. Uh -huh. That means past tense, right? You shouldn't be walking there anymore when you were living in them. But now, here's five more things we're supposed to put off because the love of Christ compels us. But now you also put them all aside. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Five more things to put off. And then he adds this. Don't lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices, and you have put on the new self, who is being renewed to a true knowledge, according to the image of the one who created it. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free men, but Christ is all and in all. Now he tells us some things we need to start doing, we need to put on. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience and then he says because you know even as Christians we're humans he says bearing with one another sometimes we just have to bear with one another and forgiving each other whoever has a complaint against anyone just as the Lord forgave you so also should you beyond all these things put on love which is the perfect bond of unity and then let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your heart to God. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks for him to God the Father. So I read that long. Yes, Kirk. What that designation you gave before about people thinking that Paul's crazy, and then you read all those yeah. Yep. It's that's true. That's true. Yeah. And, and, and I've had exactly right. And I've had conversations with people who have asked me, "Well, you know, why do you believe this stuff?" They don't get it. They don't have that spiritual enlightenment from knowing Christ. They can't figure out why, at least on occasion, I would sacrificially do something for somebody. Because they wouldn't do it. Because the love of Christ compels us in this, these lists of things that we are to be some take, putting off, some putting on. And yes, this is a process. I'll say that again. And, uh, and it's a lifelong process of what we refer to often as sanctification. So many, many practical applications of what the process looks like. Now, verse 16, back in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 16. Therefore, okay, here's another therefore. From now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. Okay. This is kind of a new, a new like, four-verse uh, section here. Uh, therefore, I, I, by the way, I want to read you the amplified version of verse 16. It's really good. It says, 
Right, Danielle, you like that one? It says, consequently, from now on, we estimate and regard no one from a purely human point of view in terms of natural standards of value. No, even though we once did estimate even Christ from a human view, viewpoint, I mean, he was a man, and as a man, yet now we have such knowledge of him that we know him no longer in terms of the flesh. So I, I kind of like that uh, description there. Now that we are saved, we should be done with carnal or superficial or earthly or mere external appearances. We should be done with that. Again, it is a process. But that process should be going on in our lives, folks, every day. It's a process, an everyday process to be done with those earthly things. Um, and so I would say along with that, allowing any human, no matter how great or amazing, to influence us, influence us too much is not wise. Paul here in this verse, he's talking about the fact that he has renounced all mere human and earthly judgment. And we need to be careful about that because we may admire somebody, you know, maybe some great athlete or, you know, one of my favorite musicians of all time, as you know, Mike, is Taylor Swift. <laughs> Shame on me. That was a lie. <laughs> Pastor's looking at me. But, but again, you know, we all have people that, you know, we may look up to, we may admire for one reason or another. And it's fine to do that. Uh, for whatever their ability, but there, too much of that is not helpful. Too much of patterning our, patterning, patterning our lives after someone can be dangerous uh, because they may not be a Christian. In fact, they may be uh, far, far removed from being a Christian. Uh, and sometimes, and you hear, and I think this is something maybe we hear among young people more, is, well, if so-and-so is doing it, you probably heard that. Maybe your kids said that. Maybe you said that. Well, if so-and-so is doing it, then hey, I can do it. Well, who is so-and-so? Gary, you got that? Hand up. You're right. Good point. Even if they're a Christian. Who is our model? Jesus is our model. Jesus is our example. So, my question is, well, what if Jesus is doing it? What were some of the things Jesus did? He got up early to pray. He spent all night in prayer up on the mountain. Yes, he sacrificed to pray. He spoke the truth. Lovingly, for sure, but he spoke the truth. Yeah, that one we may not be able to do. Kurt says he can't walk over the water, so that's, that's one that he's... So... When we talk about influences or models, let's make sure that Jesus is first and foremost in influencing us how to live, how to think, and so forth. And of course, spelled out in the Word of God. Uh, Paul indicates that at one point he had viewed Jesus from a strictly human standpoint, and that was true. He certainly did. Um, and, and of course, as you know, we see in the book of Acts, he persecuted Christians, viciously persecuted. So at that point in his life, Jesus was just a guy, maybe a false prophet or something in his mind. So even he had been there. Yeah, there's a, a, in my mind, there's a real change in that verse 16. So we stopped evaluating another from a human point of view. At one time, we saw Christ merely a human point of view. And then he says, how differently we know him now. That know yes. is so important because before he came to Christ, just well, however we call him Jesus, so what, right? Yeah. But now we know him, and that relationship makes all the difference. Yeah, and before we, we may have known of him, yes. but we didn't know him. Yeah, very good, very good. So uh, the, the human, I'm sorry, the public commentary again says, to Paul, Christ is now regarded as far above all local, national, personal, and Jewish limitations. In the, in the view Paul took of the Lord, he henceforth banished all Jewish particulars in favor of a, of a Messiah for all people. Amen? Amen? Jesus is a Savior of all people. You know, we're probably all Gentiles in here, and God said, I want to save the Gentiles too. In fact, by the way, he said that in the Old Testament. 
the Jewish people, they didn't quite get that or maybe they didn't want to get it and they were supposed to be a light to the nations and for the most part they really weren't. But God has always wanted all people to come to him. He is a Messiah, as that commentary says, for all people. Paul regards Christ not in light of earthly relationships and conditions, but as the risen, glorified, eternal, and I like this word, universal Savior. He's the Savior for everyone. As we've seen here, Jesus died for all. So here's another question. I think a, a very important, poignant question. And, and I say this because I've done it. We see, I just emphasize, Jesus is the Savior. He wants everybody to be saved, a universal Messiah. Now, we've already said not everybody gets saved. But let me ask you, are there people maybe that you have written off saying, oh, that guy will never get saved? I've done that. I've done that. Shame on me. And the Lord has taken me the task for that. Uh, I remember in 1986, I started a job. And it was a very rough bunch of guys. Rough crowd. And I remember thinking, well, this is hopeless. This is spiritually hopeless. What am I doing here? These guys can't come to Christ. Well, look, if I came to Christ, anybody can come to Christ. Trust me on that. But here I was in that situation saying, oh, this is hopeless. Well, God changed my opinion on that pretty effectively, thank God. And I worked at that place for a number of years. And now, you know what? Two of those original guys have already died in there with the Lord. And there's several more that I know that when they die, they're going to be with Jesus. So you know what? It wasn't hopeless. And God used even me to help people find Jesus when I had gone in with a hopeless attitude. So, you know, God, Jesus wants to save everyone. That's the whole point of things. So I say this as an encouragement to you. And, and you've, if you've been around me, you've heard me say this before in this class. But I don't think we can say it, say it enough. Never give up praying for salvation for people that you love, people you care about. Never give up. Um, if I would have, that first day I was working at that job, I never would have predicted the six or so guys that ended up getting saved. I never would have predicted it. But they all got saved. It was amazing. It was amazing, the transformed lives. Um, you know, recently, a few weeks ago, in this class, we read about, remember, we read about King Manasseh, the worst king who reigned for 55 years in, in, uh, in Israel, in Judah, actually. And he did things that you and I have never even dreamed about. He was so wicked. You remember at the end of his life? He turns to the Lord. And God was gracious to him and forgave him. Or Nebuchadnezzar, a pagan king in Babylon who was pretty evil, pretty wicked, and had arguably, arguably the biggest ego on earth. God humbled him, and he turned to the Lord. And at the end, I think it's Daniel 4. I've said this before, that, that Nebuchadnezzar writes these phrases about the living God that are so good, we can sing them in our sanctuary worship time. They're so good. Nebuchadnezzar got saved. And, of course, we're talking about Saul. Remember, he murdered Christians, threw him in jail. He got saved. Never give up. Never give up praying for people that you care about, family members, friends, whatever. Uh, I don't know if you've heard this, and it's hard It's hard to wrap my mind around, around this, but you probably, most or all of you know the name of James Dobson, Dr. Dobson. Dr. Dobson says Jeffrey Dahmer is in heaven right now. Wow! Wow! Now, I wasn't there. I don't know. But is God's grace deep enough to save Jeffrey Dahmer? Yes, it is. That's pretty incredible. Don't give up praying for people. I, I mentioned last week, and I'll mention it again. I'm reading this book by this guitar player who was from the heavy metal group called Korn. K-O-R-N. Yes. Lived in absolute rock star debauchery. I mean, it's sickening to read about. It. Sickening. He experienced everything you can imagine, sin wise. Got saved. Got saved. And as you read about how he came to Christ, you go, this is the real thing. Gave all this money away that he had earned in that vile group, 
turn to Christ. I mean, it's an incredible story. Now, that's one of those guys we would have said, oh, he can never get saved. It's impossible. There's no hope. He got saved. God's grace goes deep. Thank God for that. So my encouragement for us is to view people the way God views them. They need Jesus. And pray towards that. All right, let's start in on verse 17. Very, very famous verse we probably all know on some level. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. New things. Behold, new things have come. Very famous verse. The first thing I want to mention about this verse is you may notice that, that uh, like, for example, from Ephesians 3, um, we see that the blessings only come when we are in Christ. Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. One of the things we need to grab hold of is there aren't spiritual blessings outside of Jesus. Now, lost people think there are, or they think there's blessings in Buddha or Hindu or, you know, whatever their religion might be. There aren't. Spiritual blessings are only in Jesus. If anyone is in, in Christ, and only in Christ, is he a new creature? Some, some points from here. That person in Christ is a new creature, or a new creation, if you prefer. Again, not just that we have new thoughts, or new opinions, or new goals, and we should have all those. New desires, even new friends. But we are a new creature. You're not the same being you were before you got saved. It's amazing. Only God can change you in that way. Only God. No mere religion can. No philosophy can. No new uh, weight loss program can. Nothing can. Only Jesus. Only the Lord God can make us a new creature. You know John 5.24. I'll read it and then you can finish it. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of life into passed out of death into life. He's passed out of death into life. Um, you were dead spiritually. You were dead spiritually. You were born dead spiritually. So only Jesus can take us out of death into life. You're a new creature. Um, in fact, I often emphasize uh, Ephesians 2.1, Colossians, I think it's 2.13, which tell us that we were dead. We were spiritually dead. Um, and, and, and so you were born dead. You were dead when you were conceived spiritually. So you need to be resurrected, regenerated. Here's what Romans 6, 4, and 5 says. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. So that person in Christ is a new creature. When you got saved, um, theologians divide up the, some of the things that happened at the moment you got saved. And it's just so, for our own understanding, like there's initial sanctification, you got set apart to God. When you got saved, you are now, you experience initial sanctification, you're set apart to God. That's one of the things. Uh, you're now justified. You got justified. You know, it's like God is declared, you're no longer guilty. You are now, you now have the merits of Christ's righteousness put to your account. So there's a bunch of things that happen at that time, one of which is regeneration. So that means, as you can probably figure out, you now are alive. The Holy Spirit has brought life to your previously dead spirit. So now you're alive because of the presence of the Holy Spirit, which didn't happen until you got saved. He brought your life to your previously dead spirit. John 3, 3 says, uh, Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So that's essential. I think we all get that. So, oh yeah, I want to read this uh, passage from Romans 8 also about the Holy Spirit's presence. And we see in this passage, Romans 8, 9 through 11, that 
that if you have the Holy Spirit, if you have Christ, if you have Christ, you have the Holy Spirit. The reflexive is true too. You don't have Christ, you don't have the Holy Spirit. You don't have the Holy Spirit, you don't have Christ. They come as a package deal, if I can say it that way. Okay, so, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, that's just the Holy Spirit, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. So, if you have Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit. If you have the Holy Spirit, you have Jesus. They come together. You can't separate. All right, so a second thing here in this verse 17. First, it was, uh, we're a new creature. Secondly, <coughs> the old things passed away. Now, this is kind of a difficult discussion in some ways. Because what, what were the old things that passed away? We know that, and here's, here's an issue that I struggle with. Uh, we, we know that the old nature or the old man or the sin nature somehow is still in us. It's still in there. And God has not taken that away. And I've asked God many times, why don't you take that away when we get saved? He says, it's, it's not, I'm not doing that. Okay, you're God, I'm not. So it's, that old nature is still in there. Um, hence, potentially, the good news is, we can now obey God and not sin. But as I said earlier, we can also still allow sin in our lives and even to dominate our lives. The beauty is that knowing Christ, we don't have to do that, but we can still do that. And Paul talks about that, presenting yourself to sin in Romans 6. And he's talking to believers, no question about it. So we don't have to do that anymore. But sometimes, unfortunately, we still do. And we all know, maybe you've been there, Christians who struggle with uh, maybe one sin or another, and it just seems to dominate their lives. And uh, it's, it's a long road, maybe, to, to free themselves of that. I understand that. We've probably all been through that in different ways. Uh, we don't have to let that happen anymore. Before you knew Christ, you couldn't help it. You were a slave to sin. But in, and here's that word potential again. In potential, Christ has set us free from that. From that. So we don't have to do that anymore. Again, I just wrote in my notes, if you ask, why did God allow the old nature to stay in us after salvation through our earthly life? Why didn't he remove it? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, and he knows best. Yeah, Karen, God knows even better than <laughs> That's a good point. Keep choosing Jesus. We realize how dependent we are. Okay. Um, that's uh, the gift and the spirit going yeah. out. You know, yeah. you separated. And then this reminds me a lot that that line of old things that passed away um, happened at a personal level. But <clears throat> this reminds me a lot of Revelation. Says, I'm, I'm just gonna summarize. He okay. says, uh, Former things have passed away in verse 4. And he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. So we have it happening on a personal level, each one of us, old things have passed away. I hope you're uh, on a universal yeah. level. That's another time. Yeah, great point. There is that process where that's going on in our lives. That's his work. But the day will come when it'll all be complete. It'll all be are you like, please come quickly, Lord, when it, when we say that. It'll all end. There will be no more battle, there will be no more sin, no more struggle, no more temptation. All of that will end. And Jesus in the, the Lord says in Revelation twenty one that that's that. Is he took away Yeah, yeah. We, 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 we
would forget who we were. <laughs> who we <laughs> were. Who we and we do need to remember who we were. Yeah, yeah. We, would, we, would, we, would, we, just, we would just stop praising him for all that he did because our old man would cause us to forget who we are. Yeah. Who we were. And now, now who we are is a constant source of praise. It is a constant source. Right. That's your right. I mean, he doesn't remove everything. Because yes, we keep serving him, but we also we only opposite, right? We remember who we were and who we are now and who we're trying to be. Mm-hmm. Well, those are good, good points. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's something about that reminder about my struggles and who I was and where I came from and how God, how much God has. And there's something to be said for all that. Absolutely. Yeah. By his grace. By his grace. Amen. Amen. It's it's kind of like taking first date too. Where we forget. <laughs> we get we get to fall in love with him every every week. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Fifty first. I was that if we were to be that person to give him our flesh, um, how how would people be on the stage? Yeah, here are good points. Yep. Where would we have our compassion? You're right. You're right. So and where would we have fallen for him and where would we be able to not have it? Mm-hmm. You guys have answered my question. Uh, why did he do that? I, I get it now. Deanna. Um, the Lord says that we are a new creation, and it, our fully minds want to think of new creation as, as a total new creation. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's something new, but I think we have changed the world. Although we're still under the body, yeah, we are. it hasn't changed. The Book of the Bible talks about it as the physical, moral, and spiritual condition. So what we're what we're talking about is physical, moral condition. We had no moral. We were basing it on whatever human yeah. idea of right and wrong was. Mm-hmm. So that is gone. Now we understand God's moral condition is is he is right. Yes, <laughs> he is right. Period. Yeah. And then our spiritual condition, we said we were born dead. Yeah. So that has passed away. Yeah. We, that has changed. Now our spiritual condition is alive in Christ. Not bad, huh? Not bad, alive in Christ and alive forever. And our old man, our new creation, broke his neck. Yes, that's right. That's right. <laughs> Not here. Not here. Thank God. I think that that's, that's the part that we have to look at. We, we can't get wrapped up in the fact that, well, why do I still sin? Why do I do this? Why do I do that? When you accepted Christ, that those the condemnation that you felt and that you had and that judgment that you were facing. Hmm? East and west. Yeah. Gone. East and west. Yep. So yeah, now Buried in the sea. You are new. You, yeah. you are the flesh and white of Christ. Yeah, it, it really is a new creature. It really is. We are new creatures. Inside. Inside, yes. Spiritual. Oh, okay. Also, just a bit of hope of righteousness. Uh, things you hope for, things you see, you have no need of hope anymore. But. We've been justified, but we're called to a real hope of righteousness. And Jesus said that um, the Holy Spirit would convict the world of righteousness. Why? Because I go to the Father. He was the example of righteousness. Unfortunately, yeah. we can't be quite like not, that. Not like that. But the Holy Spirit can. Yeah, yeah. true. And he goes uh, on and says, Behold, new things have become, and spiritual awakening to the new life. Now, our, the, the Holy Spirit, the Lord puts inside of us now the new nature. So now we become aware of that spiritual growth. And, and the Holy Spirit even prays for us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Thank you. Uh, it's time for me to take my tie off, so we're going to dismiss now. Let me pray. Lord, thank you for this uh, wonderful time in the word, the study, the contributions by everybody. Thank you so much for teaching us by your spirit. Bless the service time. Uh, may our worship honor you and may we hear from the word and continue in fellowship and we ask it in Jesus'